I read about a rock band in the, the 70s and the 80s, and um, you know how whenever a really big band goes on tour, they have other bands who will then play as support acts, and they get the crowd all warmed up before uh, the main act comes on. And, and apparently, this massive band, or at least this is what people think was happening, they would try to pick bands to be support acts who were good, but not too good. And the reason is they were terrified that, well, what happens if the support act is better than us? And they were clearly really insecure about that happening. Um, well, we're reaching the point in Mark's gospel where the support act is walking off the stage. Uh, we see that in verse 14. John the Baptist gets thrown into prison. But as the, the support act, as the warm-up gets or leaves the stage, the main act comes on. The star of the show walks into the spotlight. And one thing's for sure. As incredible as John the Baptist was, and as incredible as his preaching was, he is never going to upstage Jesus. Because as we're going to see over and over again as we go through the book of Mark, Jesus preached like no one has ever preached before. It was electric. It was incredible. It was the most amazing preaching that the world has ever seen. And we're going to see something of that preaching tonight. Because what we're going to see is that Jesus' preaching demanded a response. Jesus made a call to everybody who heard him preach. We see as well in this passage, he made a call to these four fishermen he met by the side of the water. And tonight... As you sit in your chair, Jesus speaks and he makes a call to you. So let's come and look this evening at the call of Jesus. And the first thing we see is that Jesus' call has authority. Jesus' call has authority. Now we've got a summary of what Jesus preached, what he taught in verse 15. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And that would have sent, we, we maybe don't realise this, we're used to this phraseology, but what Jesus taught here would have sent shockwaves crashing across the country because the kingdom of God was exactly what the people of God were looking forward to. And so you think, for example, of 2 Samuel. And we've seen this promise that God made. He promises he's going to send a king. He promises that this king he's going to send is going to be far, far better than David. And he's going to completely overshadow David. This king is going to come. He's going to rescue his people. He's going to bless his people. He's going to put his enemies and God's enemies into their place. And he's going to put the, the injustices of the world right. And you could say, somebody said this, no idea who. You could say that the king is going to turn the world upside down. Except really, he's going to turn the world the right way up. And you think of the Psalms we sing. Given to us by God in the Old Testament to get us ready for the king. You think of how the book of Psalms is absolutely dripping with praise for the king. Praise for his might. Praise for his majesty, his justice, his compassion, his beauty. And, and everybody who had stayed faithful to God was waiting desperately for this king to come. They were praying that he would come soon. They were encouraging themselves with the promises that God had given that he was going to send them. They were looking forward to how everything would be so much better whenever the king has finally arrived. And they've been doing this for hundreds of years. And now, here's Jesus. 
He says to the people, the kingdom is near. I think actually maybe a, a better way of putting that, the, the ESV puts it this way, the kingdom is at hand. In other words, you could reach out, you could touch it. The kingdom's here. And you imagine the shockwaves that are rippling across the crowd. Uh, this king we've been waiting for. This king we've been praying for. We've, this king we've been, we've been hoping for. We've been longing for. And he's right there. And we're looking at him with our eyes right this very minute. Jesus is the king. And of course because Jesus is the king, that means that Jesus has authority and we see that authority in the way that he speaks and because Jesus never preaches a sermon that's take it or leave it and Jesus never gives people advice that may work for them or may not work for them you have to work it out for yourself Jesus doesn't do that Jesus is bold in fact I don't know if I can say this but Jesus is brazen if you like he is completely unequivocal he takes no hostages repent and believe the good news there's no wriggle room Jesus calls the shots and he speaks with total authority and the only question is what are the people who hear Jesus going to do about it? Will they obey the king? Or will they reject his authority? There's only two options. And that is the very same question that you face tonight. I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine I'm not here tonight. We've got a special guest preacher. I'm sure Stephen Macaulay was good this morning. He'll be nothing compared to this guest preacher. Because I want you to imagine that Jesus Christ himself is our visiting preacher tonight. And he's standing here. Right now. And I want you to imagine that you are able with your very own ears to hear the sound of his voice. I want you to imagine you look up from your Bible and there's Jesus' eyes and they are fixed on your eyes. I want you to imagine that Jesus is making one of his points and he turns his head and he looks directly at you as you make it or as he makes it. What would you do? Well, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking to yourself, I'd listen. I would do exactly what he wants me to do. I would believe whatever he tells me to believe. I would make whatever change he tells me I need to change. And yet, is there not a sense in which Jesus always stands here on a Sunday evening? Because whenever the king sends a herald to people he has authority over, and whenever he gives a message to that herald and he tells that herald that he is to announce that message the herald speaks not with his authority but with the authority of the king who sent him and yet how often have you sat there and you've heard the message of the king and yes you've heard it imperfectly because it's coming from me or from Mark but you've heard the message of the king and how often have you ignored it? Or how often have you been too distracted by all the stuff in your head to really hear it? Or how often have you listened to it and then as you've gone out the door you've put it to one side? Or how often have you decided that you're going to put into practice whatever it is that you've heard but then you've gone out and it's Monday morning and it's hard to do that and life gets in the way and you've given up very quickly. How many of us can say that every single time that Jesus has made a call to us in this room 
that we have given that call the respect it deserves. We certainly haven't done it every time. Jesus' call has authority. Not just over the people in this passage, but over us as well. And we see that authority as Jesus meets these four men in verse 16 to verse 20. Because Jesus gives them a command. And it's a big command. It's a command that is going to dominate the rest of their lives. It's going to drastically alter the direction of their lives. And actually, for two of the men, it's going to cost them their lives. At least two of them. Follow me. Um, Some of you are at secondary school. I don't know if your school has careers classes. Um, I had it whenever I was going to school. And the whole idea of careers classes is that everybody's different. And, you know, everybody has different skills and everybody has different personalities. And that means that we're all suited to different sorts of jobs. Um, But the key thing, the, the central tenet, if you like, of a careers class is it's up to you. It's in your hands. No one else can decide for you what you're going to do with the rest of your lives. It's up to you. Well... Not for James, not for John, not for Simon, not for Andrew. They don't decide what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. Because Jesus does. They're not free to decide if they're going to be full-time disciples or part-time disciples or not disciples at all. They're not free to decide which parts of Jesus' teaching they actually quite like and which parts they're maybe going to take a pass on. Jesus stands before them, the Son of God himself, the one who created every single mountain and ocean and galaxy and planet, and with all the authority that is rightfully his, he looks them in the eye and he says, follow me. And I wonder, could Jesus be speaking to you this evening with the same authority? Could Jesus be saying to you, you need to get serious about following me? Is Jesus telling you, you need to put that sin to death? Is he telling you, you need to completely cut off that person who's leading you into temptation? Is Jesus saying to you tonight, you need to stop making excuses and you need to stop letting yourself off the hook? If Jesus was the visiting preacher tonight, if he was standing here, would he say to you, you need to stop living for the here and now, and you need to start living for eternity? Is Jesus saying to you tonight, you need to stop acting as if there's parts of your life that are off limits to him? And you need to surrender every part of your life to him. Is Jesus saying to you, you need to get serious about being a godly leader within your family? Or, maybe, if you haven't done this already, is Jesus' message to you the same as what we see in verse 15? You need to repent. You need to believe the good news. Jesus speaks to all of us with authority. We need to listen and we need to obey. Second thing we see, Jesus' call is urgent. Jesus' call is urgent. And again, we see that in verse 15. The time has come. In other words... The opening act, he's walked off the stage. The man everybody's been waiting for is now here. The time has come. And one of the things that Mark is trying to do here is to get across a sense of urgency. And he does that in the way he speaks about these four men. Um, Now, I should point out that there's actually a gap in this passage uh, between verse 13 
and verse 14, there's a gap of around about a year. And we know that from John's Gospel. And we know from John's Gospel that this isn't actually the first time that these men met Jesus. We know that they heard him. They probably had opportunities to interact with him. They did, in fact, during that year. Um, And that's helpful for us to realise it's not that these men are just there doing their thing and a complete stranger comes along and says, I want you to follow me. And it's not that they sort of shrug their shoulders and think, well, yeah, why not? We'll give it a bash. No, these men know what Jesus is like. And yet it's interesting that Mark doesn't give us the full backstory. And one of the questions it's really good to ask whenever you realise something like that is, why? Why does the writer say what he does? Why does the writer leave out what he leaves out? And surely part of the reason is that Mark wants to give us a sense of just how urgent Jesus' call is. And we see that in verse 18 and verse 20. Verse 18, it's talking about Simon and Andrew. At once they left their nets and followed him. And then verse 20, which is speaking about James and John, without delay he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So these men are in a rush. So what is the rush? Well, it's all about what Jesus is calling these men to do. They're to be fishers of men. In one sense, they're to be like a spiritual coast guard. They're to reach into the waters and they are to pluck out men who are drowning. There are men and women out there. They're sort of just bobbing about in the stream of rebellion. And the water in that stream is placid and it's gentle and it's calm. And people think they're okay. But Jesus knows that as the Messiah, as the Christ, his coming is ushering in the final days. And he knows that as part of the grand sweep of history, that stream is turning into a river. And he knows that it is picking up speed. And he knows that the waters are going to get deadly fast. And he knows that there are people and they're in that river and they think they're safe, but they're being swept downstream. And he knows that just around the bend is the roaring, thundering waterfall of destruction. And Jesus knows that everybody who's still in the water, whenever it reaches those torrents, is going to go plunging to their doom. So these men need to get on with it. They need to learn from the master. They need to have their own hearts infused with the good news of the gospel. And then they need to get out there. And they need to reach in. And they need to cast their nets. And they need to rescue men and women from destruction. Because the call is urgent. And maybe for you tonight, the call is every bit as urgent. Maybe as you hear me preach tonight, as one of Jesus' heralds, as someone who's spreading the message of Jesus, maybe you haven't yet taken Jesus up on his offer of rescue. Maybe you are in the waters of rebellion right now. Maybe everything's okay. Maybe the water's calm. Maybe it's placid. Maybe it feels like there's nothing to worry about, but you're drifting. And you don't know it, you don't realise it, but you're drifting towards the waterfall of destruction. And I want to say to you tonight, you have the offer of rescue. You have the offer of rescue tonight. You have it right now, as I repeat the words of Jesus here. But you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know 
when you will be swept past the point of no return. You don't know when you're going to catch your very last glimpse of the net of salvation. And it's going to be too late. You don't know when you will be swept to oblivion. And so, if you haven't yet repented, if you haven't yet believed the good news of Jesus Christ, you need to hear the call of Jesus today. And you need to respond to it. Because Jesus' call is urgent. So Jesus' call has authority. Jesus' call is urgent. Thirdly, Jesus' call is radical. Jesus' call is radical. Jesus does not pussyfoot around. Um, He doesn't tell these men that they might want to think about dipping a toe in the water. No, he looks them in the eye. Maybe he's doing that to some of you tonight as well. And he says, follow me. And there's something so radical about what we see here. Notice James and John in verse 20. They leave their family. Now that's not to say they disowned their family. It's not to say they cut all ties with their family. But they do leave. Here's the man who raised them. Here's the man who presumably taught them how to catch their very first fish. Here's the man who they seem to work with Every single day. And they leave him. They say as much as we love him. As much as he means the world to us. Whenever it comes to Jesus. Our father is in second place. Not first. Notice as well. That they leave behind the hired men. Uh, These men. James and John. Uh, they clearly must have built up a rather strong business and because they must have been successful enough that they were able actually to take on employees as part of the business. And, and you think of what that would have involved. You think of the sweat and tears that these men must have put in to building up their business. And yet Jesus tells them, I want you to leave it all behind. It's a radical call. And as Jesus calls you tonight, he says to you, you cannot allow anything to come before me. Not your job, not your family, not your friendships, not your hobbies, not your retirement, not your social life, not your sense of sexuality. Not your desire to be in a relationship. Not your exams. Not your rainy day fund. Jesus says, I always have to come first. And maybe Jesus' call to you this evening is that you need to be more radical in following him. Maybe Jesus' call to you is that you need to start putting him first, not just on a Sunday, but from Monday to Saturday as well. Maybe Jesus' call for you is that you need to make a decisive break, just like these men. Maybe you need to get up and you need to leave something behind. Maybe it's sin. Maybe Jesus is saying to you, you need to stop telling me I'll do it soon. You need to stop telling me that you can get there by baby steps. And maybe Jesus' radical call to you tonight is you need to just leave it behind right now. And you need to follow him. Maybe Jesus is telling you, you need to take a decisive break from certain people. Maybe even for the young people. There's people in your class, people in the playground, 
people who lead you into temptation, people who fill your head with poison. And maybe Jesus is saying to you tonight, you need to leave them behind and you need to follow me. Or maybe Jesus' call to you is that you need to be decisive about who you are. Maybe he's telling you, you need to stop trying to have a foot in both camps. Maybe he's telling you, you need to stop investigating Christianity and you need to just get stuck in. Maybe he's telling you, you need to be like these men. And you need to do it right now. Or maybe for some of you, the message is that you need to be ready. Because we don't know what sort of call Jesus is going to give us over the next seven days. Maybe he's going to call you to do something really hard. Maybe he's going to call you to do something that you never thought you'd have to do. Maybe he's going to call you to walk with him in circumstances that fill you with fear and dread. Maybe he's going to call you to stay faithful under pressure that you never saw coming. Maybe he's going to call you to keep on trusting even as your world seems to fall apart. We need to be ready. Or maybe actually for most of us, Jesus' call to us is to keep on putting him first, keep on trusting him, Keep on praising him as we pass through the ordinary, boring monotony of everyday life. Jesus' call is radical. He calls us to repent and believe. He calls us to follow him. He calls us to put everything behind him, everything after him. Even the things we hold most dear. And he calls us to do it. Without delay. And there's really only one question. The question is, as you hear Jesus call this evening. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to say? Are you going to listen? Or are you going to reject the authority of the Son of God himself?